So I decided to talk about epidemiology of autism and specifically um, the work that we're doing focused on the immune system and autism and what we what that tells us about etiology. But what I what I hope to do is to take you through a journey about how we go about studying autism and and through the lens of an, of, uh, an epidemiologist. So that's what my goal is. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just what is epidemiology. I may be preaching to the crowd here, but bear with me. Um, maybe you'll you'll hear something different <laughs> from me. Um, and then a very brief description of the epidemi uh, epidemi epidemiology of autism, um, about the immune function in autism, and then future directions we'd like to take. So first of all, um, what is an epidemiologist anyway? Um, you know, no, we don't study bugs. Uh, we're not entomologists, even though the words are very similar. Um, but we study patterns of health and illness in populations. So this is very much a population-based um, discipline. And the goal is to identify risk factors for disease um, and to inform basically public health and strategies for preventing disease and ultimately to come up with treatment approaches that we can apply at the individual level. So we're taking this population-based approach, studying large numbers of people, trying to look at associations and patterns between exposures and outcomes, um, at, you know, the who, what, why, that can ultimately be used to address issues in the clinic at the individual level. So um, basically, there are just three easy steps to being an epidemiologist. The first thing we do is we define the condition that we're studying. What is it? The next thing we do is we describe it. Who has it? How many people are affected? Who are they? Where are they? When does it occur? And then finally, we analyze. We try to look at these exposure outcome associations. And uh, we try to answer this question, why does this happen? and what are the risk factors, and hopefully, what are the causal factors. So the first step is to define. So what is autism? Um, I think everybody sitting in here already knows this. What I printed here is just the, the, uh, the new criteria in the DSM-5. These are the new diagnostic criteria that were published in the last couple of years. Um, and basically, it, def it describes it this way, this persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. Um, that, in, that appear in multiple contexts. Um, this is accompanied by restricted patterns of behavior, stereotype behaviors, and narrow interests or activities. Um, and the symptoms have to be present early on in development, in the, early in the developmental period, but they may not manifest till quite a bit later. So they're, they're present, but we may not notice them until um, quite a bit later in some people. Um, and, and these symptoms are clinically um, significant in that they, they cause impairments across these different domains um, that impair function in life. Um, and that there's no other, uh, we can't explain these disturbances by, by something like intellectual disability or global, global developmental delay. So that's sort of the diagnostic criteria for what, what is autism. But um, it doesn't really tell us too much about the people that we're, we're studying. And um, I show you this picture. This is actually a, um, supposed to convey that autism is really not one thing. This is a, a piece of art that was drawn by my nephew, who's uh, 29, almost on his 30th birthday. He's autistic. And he's been drawing these animals since he was a very young child. And he drew this picture for me about five years ago, when he, about the age of 25. Um, and what I love about this is that it really, to me, really conveys this sense that, that autism is one, not one thing. It's a spectrum of disorders, um, and everybody is different, uh, you know, large and small and yellow and blue and, um, you know, giraffes and zebras. But we recognize all of these, these characters here as belonging to the fam a, a, a similar family. And, and to me, that is a, just a beautiful description of what autism is. It's really the autisms, and it's really a broad spectrum and a very diverse spectrum that, um, that we need to understand much better. So that next to describe, um, and I'm only going to describe a little bit about autism, but, and I've shown you this um, figure that, that you may be familiar with, that this really is conveying how common autism is and what's happened over the last several decades in terms of its its uh, prevalence. So early on, um, 
autism was thought to occur in about one in, in uh, or four or five per 10,000 people. And more recent estimates put that at, in fact, the most recent estimate from the CDC surveillance systems put it at one in 68 uh, individuals is affected by autism spectrum disorders. And actually quite a bit higher in males than in females because we see about a four to one or five to one depending on what level of severity you're looking at, four to one uh, relationship between uh, boys to girls affected with autism spectrum disorders. So it's quite common. Um, okay, so the next step in epidemiology is to analyze. And as I mentioned before, what we do here is we're really looking at uh, relationships between exposures and outcomes. Um, is there an association on this sort of broad population-based level when we're looking at groups of people? Um, so what, what kinds of things might be causing autism? Well, early on, um, unfortunately, autism in the 1950s or so, 50s into the early 60s, autism was thought to be uh, caused by mothers who were really not very uh, warm to their children. They were so-called the refrigerator mothers. Um, this was a, an, a, a belief system that was promulgated for, for way too long and caused a lot of pain and grief um, to families, specifically parents and specifically mothers. Um, and fortunately, that was, and there wasn't really an understanding that there was a biologic basis for autism, that it was a sort of social environment, and specifically the, the, the parenting style was such that um, it was very cold and, and, and the children were being isolated and not being, and didn't develop appropriate um, social uh, interactions with, with their family members and others. Fortunately, that, that myth was dismissed. Um, it took too long to dismiss it, but with a lot of information coming out about brain development um, and, and findings that the types of anomalies that we see in brains were consistent with an in utero um, initiation of the pathology. Um, th uh, information that came out about uh, women who were exposed to infections, specifically rubella, that the women with rubella, among those, the children born to women with rubella, there was a, a higher rate of autism than would be expected. Um, and, and other maternal infections, and I'm going to talk more about infections a little bit. Um, there was information, uh, more data coming out early on about uh, women who took certain medications during pregnancy, and their children as they grew up were, were, had a much higher probability of being diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder than you would expect. These medications, one of the big ones was thalidomide, which is a medication that was used for um, to treat morning sickness in some women. Also, uh, valproic acid, which was used to treat seizures. And so this was giving us hints that, OK, it's something going on uh, early exposures in the prenatal period. And also, a lot of uh, studies coming out that were looking at obstetric factors. And, and, and there are many different ways of measuring these, but lots and lots of studies that sort of consistent, consistently pointed towards an, associate, an association between um, problems in the in the pregnancy period and in the delivery period that were related to uh, that seem to happen more commonly um, in the in the mothers of children who were diagnosed with autism and these factors were things like bleeding during pregnancy having a cesarean section delivery versus a vaginal delivery prolonged labor uh, many different factors uh, but and 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 some of these studies looked at these factors by adding them all up and, and coming up with sort of a score, saying this pregnancy or this delivery is suboptimal, and if you had one or many of these factors, children born uh, after these kinds of pregnancies uh, had a much higher rate of having autism or a higher risk of having autism than children born to women who had sort of more typical and unproblematic pregnancies and deliveries. So all of these, um, all of, all of this evidence from different lines of studies and different qualities of studies sort of really solidified this, uh, this understanding that autism, in fact, has a biologic basis and it probably, ha and, and it has origins in very early prenatal period. Um, uh, so, so people really started looking at, uh, at autism and, and risk factors around this pregnancy period and the early postnatal period. And much of the work that I do, in fact, all of the work that I do in terms of etiology is focused around these prenatal, perinatal factors and trying to identify um, what is it about this time period and what's happening 
that may influence the development of the fetal brain and put it on a trajectory that, that leads to what we call autism spectrum disorder. Um, there's a whole other body of evidence with that I'm not showing you at all, but that, that has pointed to genetic underpinning for autism. And this has been established from um, many studies looking at different, different kinds of study designs, looking at twins, um, looking at families, and finding that, uh, that the rate of autism among, for example, I identical twins uh, is much, the, the concordance of autism in identical twins is much, uh, much, much higher than the concordance in, in uh, fraternal twins, for example. And that, and a lot of work that's been done here on the baby sibs, that the younger children of uh, the babies born into families where there's already an affected person with autism have a much, much higher chance of being diagnosed with autism down the line than a child who's born into a family where there's no history of, of autism. So um, there's very strong evidence that there's a genetic underpinning, and there's very strong ed evidence for these other sort of non-genetic factors that are happening in this perinatal period. And so um, what the current thinking is, is that uh, the, the causes of autism are really this combination of genes and environment, um, and that we have to look at both sets of conditions uh, at the same time, ho hopefully, if we have the data to do that. Um, to sort of tease, to, to understand the combinations of these factors and how they might uh, relate to the development or abnormal de uh, neurodevelopment. Um, and furthermore, that's not only a combination of these factors, but the timing is very critical. That it's something going on in this prenatal period and potentially in the preconception period as well. This, might, this trajectory might get initiated even prior to conception, uh, but certainly after conception and throughout the, the, the gestational period and probably into this early post develop, postnatal period um, where the critical time period of interest is in, in understanding what's going on etiologically. Um, and finally, given that autism is so diverse and the, the phenotype is so heterogeneous, uh, they're very, they're likely very, the different clinical subgroups likely have different sets of causes and sets of risk factors, um, making it just that much more complicated to study. Um, and you can imagine uh, from an epidemiologic point of view, given that there's such diversity and so many different kinds of autisms and so many different kinds of possible genetic factors and so many different kinds of environmental factors, to really understand what's going on and to look at this all as a group, we need very, very large numbers of people to study so that we can collect information in a systematic way and have enough people to look at so that we can, when we start identifying specific subgroups of, of people with a disorder or specific risk factors that we want to look at that might be not so common, we've got a big enough study to, when we start slicing this, this study population up, to have the statistical rigor and the st statistical power to actually find some associations that might be in the data. So th this is sort of the, the, the idea of, of epidemiology is we always like large numbers and the larger the better for us. But you know, with that, you, it brings a lot of um, uh, difficulty because if you want to go deep with the data and collect all sorts of information, on a large number of people, that's a diverse group that's representative of the, of the general population. You know, you start hearing those dollar signs or whatever, seeing those dollar signs, um, you know, fill up your your landscape because it's very expensive to do these kinds of studies. So, um, so we've taken a, a number of different approaches that I'm going to sort of talk about. Um, that are, some of which are are much more efficient. Um, and get at certain aspects of the question and other, other studies that are much more resource intensive and can get at other aspects of the, of the uh, answer, other aspects of these questions um, with different methodologies. Um, okay, so what I put up here is sort of my conceptual model of autism etiology. It's, it's, very, um, it's very simplistic, but I think uh, for me, it's been helpful in guiding my thinking about how these different sets of factors sort of interact, interrelate um, in, in time and, 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 how, and different combinations of them to sort of come together um, to uh, 
influence the neurodevelopment and, and um, ultimately influence uh, development of autism spectrum disorders. And so, you know, we've got environmental factors, we've got genetic factors, and we've got these sort of endogenous factors that could be in the immune system, the endocrine system, metabolic fa factors, and then this whole sort of set of epigenetic factors, which lie, I'm not sure if they're actually in the right bubble here, <laughs> but that's where I put them so far. Um, and, and all of these factors can either potentially act individually or in combination, two by two combinations or, or two by three, or you know, th all three combinations to influence um, the, the, the development and, and influence autism spectrum disorders. And, and autism is not just one thing. It's not just a behavioral uh, condition. You know, it had, there's developmental aspects and there's medical aspects too. So we've got a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of heterogeneity um, and a lot of possible ways of combining these factors, and, and all of them are very interesting um, to look at. Okay, so why study the immune system? Um, well, you know, for, and I have to credit Judy for this slide, this I borrowed from her. Um, for a long time, it was thought that the immune system and then the nervous systems were completely separate from each other, that they were protected from each other. But there's been a lot of research done um, to show that actually there's a lot of uh, two-way crosstalk between these two sets of systems. And for example, cytokines, which are immune mo molecules, immune signaling mo molecules, um, are produced by brain cells um, in response to infection. Um, cytokines also help neural stem cells differentiate. Uh, there are immune processes that play a role in the plasticity and connectivity of the brain during development. And there have been uh, recently papers looking at autism candidate genes that are highly expressed in brain that have actually have a lot to do with um, immune system regulation and um, cytokine signal, signaling. So, so there's, um, th there are these two systems that are, are designed to do different things, but they're, they're, they connect in many ways. And they actually connect in many ways uh, during development. Um, and some of the key factors from the immune system that, that, that affect the, the, um, the function of the nervous system are these chemicals and molecules called cytokines and chemokines. Um, and antibodies. And I'm going to show you some studies, some results from studies that, that I've done in collaboration with Judy and others uh, that are looking specifically at these kinds of molecules and, and seeing how they may relate to autism, and specifically looking at them in the prenatal period. So um, some, some just sort of a summary, a very brief summary of what we know. Um, in terms of the immune function in people with autism, there have been many genes that have been found that regulate immune response uh, in individuals with autism that occur at, a, at, a, at a, that these, these uh, polymorphisms in these genes occur more commonly in some individuals with autism compared to people without autism. Um, there are uh, different, when we look at the blood or the, or the brain or the, um, the CSF from people affected by autism, we see differences in immune markers, uh, and these differences aren't, uh, there have been many differences that have been found comparing autistic individuals with, with, with typically developing, developing individuals, but these differences kind of go across, uh, run the gamut of all different kinds of, of, of immune mo molecules and are they upregulated, are they downregulated? There's not a lot of consistency in terms of what is found in terms of um, in, across these different studies and, and what's happening in the immune system, but clearly there's a lot of evidence showing that there are, there are dysregulated immune function in individuals who have autism. Um, and also we know that there are r higher rates of, of infection, um, some reports of higher rates of asthma and allergies in children affected by autism compared to their typically developing um, counterparts. Um, so this is all measuring things that are happening in people already diagnosed with autism. Um, and so the timing um, is problematic here because we don't know are the immune changes a consequence of autism or related or on the, or a precursor to the autism? Are they along the causal pathway? Um, and uh, so one way of getting a handle at this is to look at, at 
at the mother and specifically what ideally what we'd like to do is look at the mom what's happening with her and during the period when the fetal brain is developing so when the baby is in utero um, and we also would like to know what's happening uh, but, but often we don't have the data to look at what's happening in the prenatal period so people have started uh, originally started looking at what's happening in the postnatal period and in fact looking in mothers who already have a, a child who's been diagnosed and trying to measure something in her blood um, that today, you know, with a five-year-old child may indicate what was happening early on in that prenatal period. So um, there have been different studies that have looked at different aspects of the immune system and maternal immune system um, in relation to autism. And so these are, there have been several studies looking in this postnatal period. Um, and uh, studies looking at autoimmune diseases, and then also looking at blood collected after the child was diagnosed um, and measuring different kinds of immune molecules in that blood post-diagnosis of the child to see if there was something going on that could be related to, um, that was more common in those mothers who had kids with autism compared to mothers who had, didn't have kids with autism. So these are data from, um, from the CHARCH study, I believe, um, looking at, again, postnatal serum. And this is a, a uh, blot, a Western blot, that shows the reactivity of maternal um, IgG against a human fetal brain protein. Um, and what it's showing is that, and we've got three groups of kids here. We've got kids with autism uh, here, and we've got a child, a typically developing child, and we've got a child with developmental delay that's not autism. And so what this is showing, what this study found, was that um, there were specific bands that were present in the kids with autism, sorry, in the maternal serum uh, that was collected after the child was born, and in fact, after the child was diagnosed. Um, so this is mom's serum um, that were, were present in the moms of, of who had kids with autism um, that were not present in the moms who had uh, de typically developing kids or even kids with other kinds of developmental issues. And what this shows, these were, there were two bands, one at, at 73 uh, kilodalton and one at 37 down here. And um, in some kids, both bands were there. And this was very specific to autism. We didn't see any of these uh, these patterns in these other two groups of kids. So this gives a, a, a little hint that something is different in, in a subset of these, of these women. Um, uh, but what this doesn't tell us is, again, this is postnatal serum. So it doesn't really, we can infer that maybe the same patterns were happening during this period of critical neurodevelopment when the baby was actually, when the fetal brain was developing um, in utero, but we don't really know. So, um, uh, so what we've been able to do is, uh, and others have been able to do this as well, but we've, we've um, been able to look at conditions that were, that immune system anomalies, um, both clinical and looking at biomarkers, uh, biospecimens, that are f directly from this prenatal period during the time when the fetal brain is developing and to see if there's something different about these pregnancies and the either measured in the blood or just clinically with these women, um, different in, the, in these moms who go on to have kids with autism compared to moms whose children are developing typically. So there's several different things that we've looked at and others have looked at. Um, from clinical conditions such as infection or uh, asthma and allergy or autoimmune conditions um, to looking actually at the blood, measuring things in the blood and looking at, at inflammatory markers um, such as cytokines and, and chemokines. Um, other studies have also been able to look at amniotic fluid, which is also a great thing to be able to look at um, if, you can, if you have a bank of amniotic fluid that you can look at. Um, so. Um, Using so th these are just uh, papers flashing up here. That there's been several, several, several papers published over the years looking at maternal infection 
uh, and um, its association, an infection during pregnancy or around the time of pregnancy and its association with autism spectrum disorders in the children. Um, many different study designs have been used uh, to do these studies. Some studies are based on surveys of families who are coming into a clinic um, who have children with autism and basically the, the the mothers, it's typically the mothers are asked, um, you know, did you, were you, were you sick during pregnancy and did you have a fever and, um, you know, tell us, try to remember back maybe five years ago or seven years ago or ten years ago and, you know, what was, what did you have during pregnancy that, that in this infection realm. Um, the, and, and, and sometimes these survey, these kinds of studies have not had a comparison group, so they've just t had families who have autistic children and asked the mothers, um, what did you experience? And I think everybody would appreciate the limitations of that kind of study where you don't, number one, um, you don't have anybody to compare it to, and number two, you're relying on what a mother can remember, and sometimes it's years in the past, and these, these studies are really plagued with what we call recall bias, um, and, and uh, you know, basically, do people, people are gonna be more likely, typically, people who have children with some kind of developmental issue um, may have been searching and searching and searching their minds for something that may have caused this, and they may be much more likely to remember something uh, that happened than a woman with a child who's five years old now who is, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, typically developing. She may not remember at all that she had some kind of infection, uh, you know, early on in pregnancy and, and not report it. So that kind of study is, is sort of plagued with um, problems. Other studies have been set uh, in registries, like the Scandinavians have these incredible registries um, where they've recorded, everybody gets a number at birth, and everything is recorded on these people, as far as I can tell, and, and, um, and all of their encounters with the healthcare systems are recorded, and their diagnoses are recorded in databases. And so you have, have very large numbers of people um, <clears throat> who you can, you can obtain information on without actually having to talk to anybody. It's all in these databases. And all these databases can be linked together by this unique, it's like a social security number. Um, and, um, and so you can look at, at children with autism and look at what's recorded on their mothers in terms of what happened during the pregnancy period and compare it to a group of a very large group of kids who don't have autism and also look at the same records and see what's recorded from, from them. And there have been several studies that have, that have looked specifically at maternal infection and, and found uh, associations with an increased risk for autism associated with maternal infection. Um, there, there are other studies that, that, such as those that we've done in our HMO population in, in Kaiser Permanente, where again you have a, a you have a sort of a captive audience. You have a membership that you can um, de describe very well, and all of the all of the interactions that the patients have uh, with the medical system are recorded in an electronic medical record, which is really a wonderful resource for epidemiologists. And we can, again, without having to talk to anybody, and we can, these, we can look at diagnoses that were recorded, made by physicians and recorded during a pregnancy way before the outcome of that pregnancy was known and way before you know, anybody knew that autism um, w was going to be uh, found. And uh, so they're sort of prospectively recorded information, but you can do a retrospective study, meaning you can start with children with autism and a group of children without autism and look back into the records of the mothers and, and then uh, looking at that, 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 data, that information that was recorded without knowing the outcome, you, get a, you don't have this issue of, of recall and response bias and things like this. And so in that kind of setting, we've also found um, associations between maternal infection and autism. But what, um, what's been the case with all of these studies is, is that yes, there's the body of evidence basically suggests that there is an association, but there's great inconsistencies um, regarding the type of infection. Is it a viral infection that's important, a bacterial infection? And also about the timing. Um, you know, is it at first trimester or, or, or a late pregnancy infection? That's sort of the, the kind of infection that is related to this increased risk. There's not a lot of consistency in the, in the research around that. 
Um, and furthermore, some papers don't find, uh, some researchers don't find an association with the infection, but they find an association with fever. So that the fever would be sort of a response to the infection. And uh, so the question is begged, well, is it, is it the infection itself or is it some kind of immune response to the infection, the body's response to this, that is the sort of the critical um, element here in terms of risk for autism. So there have been a number of animal studies that have been done um, to try to answer this question where the, the pregnant um, dams are, are exposed to something that's not an infection, but it's something that will induce an immune response. And so you can, you're taking the, the actual, the organism out of the picture, but you're, you, can, you can isolate on this in, in immune response. And they look and see what happens to these pups of these, um, of these uh, pregnant animals that are, that are exposed to this sort of infection-like entity, but it's not an actual organism that they're exposed to. And you can look for changes, you can look at behavior and development in these, in these um, newborn animals. And what people have shown is that, um, in fact, you can, uh, um, based on the, that, that you, the, the baby animals, uh, it, mice and, um, and uh, it's also been shown in monkeys uh, it, here too, that these, these animals have uh, behaviors that are sort of similar to autistic-like behaviors and the way you can measure them in mice and, and other, other animal models. Um, and there was no infection, there was no organism, but there was a, the, the immune molecules were introduced and that's what the, the gestating animal was, was exposed to. So, um, so that's a very interesting thing, and, and we want, we're very interested in looking at that in people, too. And I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes uh, what we've done to be able to some similar studies uh, to look at the immune response specifically during pregnancy and how that may, in moms, and how that may relate to autism. Um, so in addition to, to infection, um, there's also a lot of, uh, uh, there's a big body of epidemiologic studies that have looked at maternal autoimmune diseases um, and autism. And in fact, there was just recently a paper, a review paper published that sort of, I think, did a meta-analysis taking all these different 10 papers together and looking at the findings, all com uh, combining them. and came up and, and basically the conclusion is, yeah, based on findings from, again, studies done with very different study designs that have a lot of different um, uh, pros and cons to them, these different study designs, that most studies show an association with autoimmune disease, maternal autoimmune disease, um, but the specific, and it's about a 30% increased risk associated with a, a clinical d a diagnosis of an autoimmune disease sometime around the time of pregnancy. Um, but all of these individual stu studies come up with different kinds of autoimmune diseases that are associated. In some studies, it's rheumatoid arthritis. In others, it's thyroid disease. In others, it might be uh, lupus. There's not a lot of consistency. So, the, it, it, and furthermore, in studies that have been able to look at the timing, the timing of these of when this autoimmune disorder might be most active, if you can measure that, is and and uh, in relation to risk for autism, is not consistent either across studies. So. I think you're getting the picture that there's, you know, sort of at the 30,000 foot level, we see good evidence that there's associations with maternal infection and immune system disturbances in pregnancy and increased risk for autism. But specifically what it is, we don't, it's kind of fuzzy. We don't really know what's going on. Is it the organism? Is it the disease? Is it the immune response to the disease and those molecules that might be somehow impacting the developing fetal brain? So, um, these are just data from one of the studies uh, that, that uh, we conducted within Kaiser um, looking at clinical diagnoses of autoimmune diseases in moms, asthma and allergies around the time of pregnancy. And what this shows is that um, we found overall for any autoimmune disease, these are moms with kids with autism and these are the mothers with kids without autism. And, um, and this is this is around the time of pregnancy. This was sort of in a in a in a two year time period that surrounded the pregnancy. And when you look at all autoimmune diseases combined, we didn't really see any case control differences. But when we looked at specific autoimmune diseases, again, our numbers get very small here. But we did see significant differences and increased rates of psoriasis and type one diabetes in the mothers 
who had children with autism compared to controls. But what was even more striking, and, and actually once we adjusted for uh, uh, other variables that were different between the cases and the controls, the only um, significant finding we had here in terms of the autoimmune diseases was maternal psoriasis. But what we did find in this study was that asthma and allergy diagnosed in moms around the time of pregnancy were strikingly different, and in fact, elevated in the, in the moms who had autistic kids. And this, this did, um, did persist after we did a, a much better analysis and controlled for many factors we know can be associated with both uh, autism and with asthma and allergy. Um, and what we found was about a two, two and a half fold risk associated with second trimester diagnoses that record, were recorded in the second trimester. Um, so I know that this has been looked at in the charge data and a paper's been published recently. Um, and I, I believe the finding was that it wasn't specific to autism, but when you combine autism and developmental disabilities, those two groups of kids, there was an association, but it, it, it wasn't, um, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure you guys looked at timing, but um, we can talk about that after. So, um, so one of the drawbacks of, of these studies is that, you know, we can look at clinical, clinical indicators of immune function in moms, but we don't have any way of measuring, um, we didn't have any biosamples from the pregnancies. So to overcome that limitation, um, I launched this study called EMA, Early Markers for Autism Study, that Judy mentioned in the introduction. And this was, the first study was funded, I think, in 2003. So this has been going on for quite a long time. And this was a study that we thought, okay, how can we do this sort of on the cheap, um, even though it wasn't cheap, but how could we do this using existing resources out there? So what we were able to do is take advantage of um, some biospecimen repositories from prenatal screening and newborn screening, and diagnoses from the Department of Developmental Services from the service agency where we can identify kids pretty easily who have a diagnosis of autism and kids who don't, to investigate early biologic markers for immune system function um, and basically susceptibility um, and exposure from the critical periods of neurodevelopment, of fetal brain development. And so those are in the prenatal period into the newborn, the neonatal period. And we wanted to look at as many things as we could in these samples uh, and in these data. And we were particularly interested in looking at immune factors, but we also looked, we were able to look at genetic markers um, and also environmental exposures. So um, what we did was we identified children, so this is sort of a, a this is a case, a case control study with prospective data collection. Um, and again, we were able to do this study without having to contact anybody um, and collect any new information. We used all existing information and specimens, and then we generated a lot of new data by analyzing those biospecimens. So what we did is we first identified children who were receiving services for autism or for a developmental disability other than autism through the statewide service delivery system, the Department of Developmental Services, in counties where there was an existing prenatal specimen biobank that was created by a colleague of, my, of mine, Dr. Marty Karazi, um, that was, and these prenatal specimens were basically leftover specimens from prenatal screening. So he was, um, had the foresight to create this specimen repository to get leftover little bits of blood that was collected after the prenatal testing was done for, um, for prenatal screening that a lot of women uh, take advantage of in this state and have that leftover serum, and it was really just a tiny amount of serum, like two mLs at the most, saved in a, in a, in a freezer, basically. And, and um, so we were able to get permission to use these specimens. And in California, also all babies, and well, actually all across the country, um, but in California, the newborn screening blood spots, um, that the, every baby is tested for a number of metabolic disorders and other things in, at birth by pricking the heel of the baby and spotting the blood onto these filter papers. And uh, there's, there's this routine prenatal screening done on every baby. But in California, 
um, all of the leftover blood is saved in a freezer, in a, like a huge Costco style freezer, and researchers can get access to these specimens. So we identified, starting with the kids getting services at the DDS, we identified three group, groups of children, those with autism, those with developmental disorders, with not autism, and then a group of kids from just from the birth certificates who didn't have either of these conditions and were not receiving services in the Department of Developmental at DDS, at a regional center. And then from that group of kids, we then linked to the prenatal specimen archived and to the newborn screening archived and found those kids who, for whom we could find both mom's prenatal blood and newborn blood. Um, and, and that's our study population for EMA. Um, so again, we have prospectively collected information and it's a very efficient way to do things because we didn't have to enroll people and you know collect blood during pregnancy and then wait for the kids to grow up and to see if they get diagnosed or not. And so we've been able to we did the, we've done two phases of this study, um, and these are the, the these are all the things that we've been able to measure in these specimens. So in the in the prenatal specimens, we've measured a bunch of um, a number of different environmental exposures. Um, in, and in, the, um, in both the mother and baby specimens, we've done whole genome-wide um, panels, genome-wide uh, SNP panels, GWAS panels, and also looked at specific uh, candidate genes, uh, such as MET, that you couldn't measure very well on these panels. And then we've also, in both mom's prenatal blood and baby's blood, we've measured a number of immune markers, cytokines and chemokines and C-reactive protein, immunoglobulins, autoantibodies, um, all with the goal of trying to understand, you know, how all of these different components come together to result in this down here. Um, and it's been a really fun study, and we keep adding more and more things to it. We've, it's amazing how much we've been able to eke out of these tiny little bits of blood. Uh, uh, but it's, it's been really a, a great thing. So I'm going to show you next some results from, um, from this study. And the results that we published, um, we have a lot more in the works right now, but the results we published uh, with respect to the, to the, um, to the immune markers. So, um, so this looks very familiar, right? This is very. This is this this blot that I showed uh, looks like the one that I showed before. But what's interesting about this is that this is again this is prenatal serum. What I showed you before was postnatal blood from moms after the kid was already diagnosed. This is during pregnancy, and what we found, which was really wonderful, is the same kind of band patterns that were coming up, the 73. And in this case, in the 37, and we also discovered this band around 39 uh, kilodalton in the kids with autism, um, but not in the kids uh, who were typically developing. So this was very consistent with the, the earlier work that, that Judy and colleagues had done um, showing this, 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 these autoantibodies to fetal brain protein that are actually happening during the gestational period. We also looked at, at cytokines and chemokines and found some significant differences in the serum, uh, the prenatal serum of the moms um, who went on to have kids with autism compared to the moms who had typically developing kids, this is general population, or kids with developmental delay. And specifically, the three cytokines that came up in this study were interferon gamma, IL-4, and IL-5. Those were significantly elevated in the moms who had autistic kids compared to the, to, to the um, general population controls. Um, and uh, all, of th all three levels of these cytokines were, were very correlated with each other. We also found some differences when we looked at the DD group compared to the general population group. And in this sense, in this uh, case, we found that the IL-6 was elevated in the mothers of, the, of these kids uh, compared to the general population kids. And IL-6 is one of the cytokines that can cross through the, um, through the placenta and into the baby circuit, into the, the developing baby circulating blood. We didn't, surprisingly, we didn't see any difference um, between the ASD kids and the general population kids, but the DD, the, the mothers of the DD kids were significantly higher compared to these other two groups. Um, 
So what does this mean? Um, what was interesting is this, this pattern of, of the increase of the interferon gamma IL-4 and IL-5 was pretty consistent with the findings we've, we, we reported based on the clinical um, uh, picture of the moms, this asthma allergy sort of phenotype of the moms. And these are the cytokines that you would expect to see elevated in people with allergy and asthma. So that was sort of a nice kind of validation of, of our earlier findings. Um, and we don't really know, you know, how the, what the mechanism is and how it how these elevated cytokines might be influencing fetal development, brain development, um, and so a lot more work has to be done there to to understand that. This is these are the results that are just being written up now and going to be submitted, I think, at the end of the week <laughs> um, or next week. Um, based on phase two. So phase, uh, EMA, this is again EMA. The phase one was a very small study. It was about 80, 85 kids with autism compared to about 160 controls. This is based on about 400 kids with autism and about 400 controls. And we did the same thing. We, did, we looked at panels of cytokines and chemokines. And we found, um, we did find significant associations, but they weren't really consistent with what we found before uh, in terms of the individual markers. So what this figure is showing in red are the significant findings where we have elevations in the first group compared to the second group, and the blue is where there are, um, the levels are lower in this first group compared to the second group. And we, in this study, since it was so much bigger, we had the ability to sort of sub-phenotype the autism group. Um, we didn't have a lot of deep information about the phenotype, but we did know if the child also has an, had an intellectual disability or not. Um, uh, and uh, so what, what was interesting, what came out of this study uh, is that there were, when you look at, all, and I don't even have a column for this, but when you looked at all the kids with autism combined and compared those to the general population controls, we didn't see any significant differences in the maternal prenatal serum in terms of cytokines. But when you look at subgroups, and specifically this group with, with intellectual disability, compared to every other group, compared to the general population controls, compared to the DD controls, and compared to the ASD kids without intellectual disability, we see significant elevations in certain kinds of cytokines and chemokines um, that have to do with inflammation. <clears throat> and uh, these, these certain, these molecules are typically downregulated in mid-gestation, but for some reason in these women, they, they haven't been downregulated, they're elevated. So um, it, it sort of suggests that there's a lack of a typical immune regulation during pregnancy, and why that is, we don't know. Um, we have the ability now to look at... Um, uh, so with the with the EMA data now we we've 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 done this. We're looking at other immune molecules in association with outcome. We're looking at the environmental exposures in association with the outcome. We're looking at the genes in association with the outcome, and then we have the ability to look at combinations. So this is what we're working on now: is trying to understand what are the mechanisms. How does the again measuring you know from biologic specimens measuring during pregnancy metabolites of environmental exposures, what's happening in the immune system biologically and uh, in terms of outcome, and folding in the genes as well. And pretty soon we'll be able to look at everything combined. It's a fairly small um, study to, to really look at gene environment interactions, but we're taking some, some interesting approaches to trying, to trying to see how the protein marker data informs our genetic findings and vice versa. Um, and so that's, that's all ongoing, and I think we'll be having lots of interesting results come out um, very soon on that. So finally, um, I'd like to um, talk about, well, one other study that's ongoing and then some, uh, a future study that's planned. Um, so again, so, so EMA was great. It's, a, it's, a, it's, I think, an improvement over these sort of case control studies we do where we're not there during the pregnancy to, um, um, I'm sorry, it, it's an improvement over the studies, yeah, like case control studies, like 
like charge or seed where we're not there during pregnancy to, to measure, to collect blood. EMA, we were able to collect blood, but we only had blood from one time point in pregnancy. And pregnancy is a very dynamic process and it changes over time. And so we don't really know, you know what, what we measure on one day during the second trimester, if that's really very representative of what's happening over this whole pregnancy. Furthermore, we didn't have any good clinical information on the mothers because we relied on these databases that, that didn't have that information. So the early study is another kind of study um, that is trying to get at the same questions, but using a truly prospective design, meaning we're um, following women who already have a child with on the spectrum, and we're following them from the beginning of a new pregnancy. Um, this is the early study, which uh, UC Davis Irva hertz is is, a, is one of the PIs on this multi-site study. It's very similar to the marble study that's being done here. And this is an attempt to, again, in efficiently um, pick a group of women who are at high risk for having uh, an autistic child and follow them from the beginning, very, very beginning of pregnancy with detailed data collection all throughout the pregnancy. And after the baby is born, detailed data collection on the baby and evaluating them periodically every six to 12 months to see what happens in terms of their development. Um, and, and this study is ongoing and we're just starting to, to look at the data and publish uh, results, uh, which I'm not gonna present any of here, but it's just to, to illustrate the kinds of things you can do. Um, and in this study, uh, you, we, can, we can look at environmental exposures, we can look at, at the phenotype, we can look at genetics, and we can look at the epigenome, and we can kind of bring everything together. Um, but the, the, and so it's a very, very powerful study design, but it's, it's got a couple of limitations. One is that we're looking at this high-risk population. So how generalizable is that to everybody with autism? Not everybody with autism, in fact, most people don't come from a family where there's already somebody with the diagnosis. Um, and so how different or similar are these women and what they're experiencing during pregnancy to sort of the general population of autism? That's one drawback. The other drawback is we have a relatively small sample because it's a restricted sample, it's this high-risk pregnancy cohort, these families are incredibly burdened already. They've got an autistic child at home. To participate in a study like this takes an enormous amount of dedication and time and, and uh, perseverance. And so the, and it's a very expensive kind of study to conduct. So the numbers are relatively small and that limits your ability to, to do all sorts of different kinds of uh, analyses that you need much larger um, numbers to do. So, so where do we go from here? Um, you know, I've sort of talked about a lot of different kinds of study designs and some great things about them and some limitations of them. Um, I want to tell you uh, finally about a resource that um, that we have in, at Kaiser, where I work, that I think is going to sort of address not all the issues and not all the limitations, but in a again in a very efficient way, um, be able to do these kinds of prospective pregnancy cohort studies in a relatively efficient way and get the information collected when, when, when it's actually occurring um, so that you can look at outcomes in kids. And not only look at autism, but look at a whole range of neurodevelopmental outcomes and really begin to understand what's unique to autism and what's maybe specific or what's general to development, child development. So <clears throat> um, at Kaiser, we have a big research division that's embedded in this, in this, in this, in this um, system that provides healthcare. We have this huge membership, very diverse membership. Um, we've got clinicians who are experts in autism diagnoses. We've got longitudinal medical records. Um, and we've got, we've built a big biospecimen repository and we can take advantage of all this information on a very large population to do some pretty cool epidemiologic work um, in a relatively efficient way. Um, and the population at Kaiser in terms of autism is, um, is very large. We have current, we do a census every year and among the current members, this is as of June of this year, we had nearly, um, uh, nearly 20,000 individuals across the lifespan who have a diagnosis of autism in their medical record. 
Um, and we've done a lot of validation studies looking at, you know, how, is it really autism when the medical record says it is? Um, and actually, in, we haven't looked yet in the kids, but in the, I'm sorry, in the adults, but in the kids, based on record reviews and also um, clinical, uh, comparing what's in the record with these sort of gold standard clinical assessments that kids have had um, by, from participating in our research studies, the, the diagnoses are, are fairly valid. Not 100%, but you know, 80, 90%, 95% valid. So we have this large captive uh, population <laughs> to invite into studies. Um, and um, uh, we also have great retention. So people who are, who are at Kaiser typically stay in Kaiser, especially if they have a, a chronic health care condition such as autism. And now that there's this autism insurance legislate reform where the health plans actually have to pay for interventions like behavioral interventions is even more of an incentive for families to stay in the health plan and be insured by Kaiser so they can take advantage of, the, of those services. Um, in terms of how representative our population is, um, we've the, in terms of demographics, it's very representative. We see the same male-female ratio and so on. I'm not going to go into that. This just shows the prevalence. And um, you can see it, it, it pretty much mirrors what those popular, that one in 68. In fact, our numbers are a little bit even more, uh, is a little bit higher. The prevalence is a little bit higher in the kids in that kind of eight-year-old range. Um, and then, you know, it drops dramatically as people age, and I think there's a huge amount of under um of autism in this age range. Uh, but qu it's quite high in all these other um, age groups. So, so the other thing we've built in Kaiser over the past five years or so is this pregnancy cohort. <clears throat> and this was built as a resource for future, future research um, for doing autism or any other kind of research. What we've been able to do is invite prenatal, all women who come in for prenatal care, which is about 95% of pregnant women in Kaiser come in for prenatal care pretty early. At the point at which they come in for prenatal care, they're invited to donate a blood specimen. Um, when they go to the lab for their routine clinical blood draw, they can consent to get an additional couple tubes of blood taken. Um, that will be banked for future research. And so um, we can combine that f first, and we collected it the first and second trimester, we can combi combine the blood specimens with the comprehensive medical record information, and they also complete a short survey about factors that we don't get in the medical record, such as you know some lifestyle factors that we don't typically record. And we've been successful over the last five years to enroll about 20,000 pregnancies, um, and this is about a 20% response rate of all the patients that we've tried to recruit. Um, and most of these women have donated two samples, both in the first and second trimester, and a little less than half have completed the survey. And what's remarkable is that the people who, this 20% who have participated are incredibly representative of the overall prenatal populations, because we know everybody who's pregnant, we've got our databases, and we can compare, and when you look at demographic factors, you look at birth outcomes, and you look at some uh, lifestyle factors like smoking and drinking, they're very, very representative. So it's a, it's a great population to do studies on. So I've been waiting, and I started building this thing in 2010, and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting until there's enough babies born who have reached the age, at, they're old enough to get a diagnosis and where we could have enough people to study. Um, and so finally the time has come, and uh, actually Judy and I just put in a grant to do a study that's very similar to Early and Marbles and EMA, but with hopefully some improvements um, in that the numbers can be quite a bit larger. And we can look at the maternal immune profile and the metabolic profile by measuring, you know, biologically looking at immune, at biomarkers of these, of immune function and metabolic function during pregnancy at two time points in the first trimester and the second trimester and look at maternal genetic factors and look at how, at different demographic characteristics of the women and their clinical profile going during this time period and link that to um, the outcomes of their children, and not just look at autism, but look at cerebral palsy, look at other developmental delays, and down the road, as different things emerge, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, 
you know, you can think of anything you want. We can, we'll have these very early markers of future neurodevelopmental outcomes. And so we're hoping um, if we're successful and this gets funded, we'll be able to launch this study and have an have a incredible resource to be able to address some of the limitations of these past um, studies that we've been doing. So why is any of this important? Um, as I said, we hope to identify patterns of maternal health conditions and biomarkers um, that indicate risk at very early on for future uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. And that's important because early identification, as we all know, can lead to earlier intervention, and earlier intervention can lead to uh, preventing future morbidity and improve, improving the quality of life, um, not only for the affected person, but for their family and their communities. And in addition, the identification of these early biomarkers um, of prenatal risk will hopefully shed, well, will shed light on biologic mechanisms, and that can drive some more basic science studies to look at how is this actually happening, and then hopefully that will drive the, um, the development of specific interventions, uh, treatment strategies, and that could be really targeted to specific individuals based on their individual profile. So that's, that's our goal. Um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Um, it's been really exciting <laughs> collaboration and um, a lot of questions to answer and great resources for others to collaborate with us on. So um, if you're interested in any of this, you know, I'm always happy to talk to, to, to people and talk about new, new collaborations. Thank you very much. Questions. One, you said that there was an increase in incidence on identical twins. How does that compare with fraternal twins? And then the other question is, is there, a, in children born out of parents with ASD, is there an increase in incidence of ASD? Yeah, I'm going to address your second question first, and then I'm actually going to ask you to repeat the first question because I didn't quite hear it. But the second question was, is there an increased incidence of autism among children born to parents with autism? Was that your question? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So we have the opportunity in this database to look at that as well, because as you saw, we have very large numbers. And in fact, um, this is a paper that we're working on with my colleague, Neil Risch, who's a um, geneticist at UCSF. Um, we find very high rates of autism among, in the children who have one or two parents with the diagnosis. And it's something on the order of, I think, um, uh, let's see, how does the statistic work? It's 30%, it's, uh, so like the recurrence risk in baby SIBs is, is 20%. In these children who have parents with autism, it's something like 30%. Um, so it's 30 to 40 percent. It's very, very high. We still have fairly small numbers of these families, uh, but this is one thing that we hope to address in the, um, the Autism Family Biobank because we do have several, when we've identified these trios of families that we want to, we want to um, enroll, we're finding that some of the parents are in our databases with an autism diagnosis and their children also have an autism diagnosis. So I'm gonna go after those families very rigorously to try to enroll them and try to understand what's going on. Your first question was about twins, but I didn't quite understand what it was. You mentioned that there was an increased incidence of ASD in identical twins. Yeah. That the same increase hold for fraternal twins. Okay. Right, so about twins and, and incidence of autism. So um, we do know that being a twin is one of the risk factors for autism. So twins, whether you're fraternal or identical, that's, that, that puts you at increased risk for having a diagnosis with autism. Twinning actually puts you at increased risk for many, many outcomes, not just autism. And what I was trying to say about fraternal and identical is that among identical twins, the concordance, that is, if, if one twin has autism, the likelihood that the other twin has autism is much, much higher than in fraternal twins. If one twin has autism, you're, you're not as likely to have it, but still greater than if two, two siblings who were born at different times. Uh, that's what, yeah. Have you found any correlation about um, if with parents who've done IVF or any like with the frozen embryos? 
any correlation with that? So the question is about infertility treatment and autism risk. Um, we've done one study looking at infertility history, a history of infertility and, um, and treatments, but we weren't able to look at IVF. And um, we, we didn't find any association with infertility. There, are other, there is a body of research looking at infertility and infertility treatments, and I think there is some data that shows an association. I'm not, you know, right now I'm not 100% um, really familiar with, with all of the results, but this is, a st this is an area that's, very, that's being studied by many people because it's, it's a, you know, infertility treatment. It, age of mothers has increased over time. Infertility has also, I think, and treatments have increased over time. And could there be some association, could there be some explanation about infertility? So um, there's, there's a lot of studies that will be able to address that, uh, like the early study and the, and the seed study and the charge study and the marble study, all these big uh, epidemiologic studies, but the data aren't, haven't quite come out yet. So I'm wondering how the Fragile X uh, is, uh, plays into your studies, just because so many of the women with the Fragile X premutation have immune-mediated disorders or mm -hmm. autoimmune disease, and mm -hmm. they're very high risk to have Fragile X kids, both, and the autism occurs, can occur in both premutation and full mutation, but we see an awful lot of gray zone these 45 to 54 CGG repeats in autism, and I'm wondering if you're looking at how that impacts some of your um, immune studies or prevalent studies, or? We haven't, yeah, you know, we haven't looked at that yet, but that would be an interesting thing to do. I, I wonder, I, you know, I haven't looked at, to see how many, what's the, prevalence of Fragile X? I mean, how so we see about <coughs> one in 200 women uh, here through newborn screening is a carrier. So they would be ones that would be at very high risk for immune dysfunction and mm -hmm. then at high risk for having kids with Fragile X syndrome. But also we're very interested in immune dysfunction mm -hmm. with premutation involvement and how that can push them towards autism. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be a great thing to address with this Autism Family Biobank because we'll have specimens from the moms, from the dads, and the kids, and we'll have all the clinical data. So that's the kind of thing that we'll, we would be able to, I don't know, with 5,000 5, women, if that would be even large enough, but it probably would be. Oh, to, yeah, it definitely to would look be, at and particularly for gray zone for issues. The, for the premutation things. And the, yeah, yeah, but also the gray zone is pretty common in the general population. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be important yeah. to look at too, influencing yeah. the risk. It's just another additional genetic factor. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that, that's something to put on the list, definitely. Once we have the genetic samples <coughs> analyzed. I was really uh, intrigued by the finding where uh, you, you found that breaking down your group into the with intellectual disability and without, you, you saw an association that you didn't see it that, that yeah. when they were, you know, treated as one. And I wonder if that's led you to think about kind of breaking down the autism diagnosis and looking at it in more in a dimensional way to look at whether some of the symptoms are related but not the diagnosis since it hides so much variability. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And it, yeah, of course we'd love to do that. In EMA, you know, that was the, that's the, that, that was the, the um, uh, limitation, one of the many limitations of EMA, even though it's got a lot of positive things going for it. Um, we don't have deep phenotypic behavioral information about those kids. It's just what we've been able to get out of the, the D, by reviewing the regional center records, because they're all DDS clients and whatever we can get there, which is not a whole lot. So um, with hopefully with this new study and centering it in a, in a cohort where we have much better phenotypics, still probably not as good as w what we would need to do what you're doing, but we, can, we could always bring these kids back in if we want to and you know, do a, a much um, deeper dive and work up on them. Uh, but that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's very intriguing because this whole, I don't know, Judy, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but the, we were kind of surprised to see this and really excited because it really, it's such a differentiator between this group with intellectual disability and without. And they're very different from the, the DD kids who, many of whom have intellectual disability but not autism. They're, they're different. Yeah, okay, actually that was my question about how, how do you, are you to further sort of slice and dice the data so that, you know, 20 years from now or any sort of markers that, you know, say the diagnosis changes, how do you kind of determine, 
you know, are you going to break down the data even more now that you've seen those markers and do you have ideas on that? And then just one follow-up thing is um, I'm part of the biobank, so I'm part of your study. Oh, um, yeah, so we, you know, we'd we like to slice and dice as much as we can, so we need good phenotypic information and we need large numbers and uh, so, you know, we're trying to build these resources so that we can do, in the EMA study, we can't slice and dice any more than we've done because we, that's the limit. We, we also looked at, we were able to look at early onset and regressive autism. So those are the really only two dimensions that we could slice and dice the ASD cases because it's very limited what you can get from records from the developmental, dis, you know, DDS records. It's, 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 um, it's not real deep what you can get phenotypically. You know, I just had one coming. You know, I think one of the things is to take this even further in the future is w which kids we can sort of get a picture of and how they do in inter d various interventions, yeah. right? So could, yeah. at least through the Kaiser, you know, you'll be able to track yeah. in the success of different interventions because that's another way of phenotypically sort of identifying them, you know, what they respond to. So we can actually predict and help maybe guide intervention. Yeah. Could you just touch upon the differences you found in the early onset versus the regressional autism that you just touched upon? Yeah, and I don't think we found any because they otherwise they would be up on that slide that I showed, I think. Judy, do you, or Karen, if Karen's in the Karen? audience? We didn't see any. Yeah, I we think didn't there see was any. So in terms of the cytokines, chemokines, and, no, and maternal, we didn't? Yeah, the only place we've ever seen is with the maternal autoantibodies. There's a higher, oddly enough, a higher percentage in the regressive versus the early onset that have that. And that's coming. So we've, we're, yes. Judy's working on doing yes. the autoantibodies, they've the maternal. Been started. Um, the they've emotions, been started yes. for EMA, for this larger group of EMA. So we'll see if we can replicate what we found in these other studies and hopefully extend that as well. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.